Those who have been following the channel since the beginning are already familiar with Kabukicho, right? I believe it's one of the neighborhoods I visit the most on the channel because, besides having the best stories to share here in Tokyo, it also has an incredible aesthetic, don't you think? So, I really enjoy strolling around there and taking photos. Those who have been following the channel since the beginning must be tired of seeing Kabukicho and hearing the stories about it, aren't they? But, as it never gets old, right? And there are many people who came to my channel after that start when I talked more about subjects like accusations and the mafia, those things. So, there are people who didn't have access to that part and don't know about the controversies that have already been discussed. Therefore, this time, I'll make a video compiling all the controversies of Kabukicho, all the stories to tell about that neighborhood. That way, I can walk around there, even in the rain at night. Since these topics are interesting, I believe it's never too much, there's always something new to add. The visuals are always very beautiful. Along the channel, there will probably be many interesting and new things to discover about this region of Tokyo, which is the area with the highest Yakuza activity, the highest mafia activity in all of Japan. And that's it, guys, let's walk there, let's go. Well, whenever I come to shoot here in Shinjuku, I inevitably end up passing through Omoid Yokocho before going to Kabukicho, right? Because this alley has a really cool atmosphere, with its lanterns, the smoke, especially when it's raining, everything becomes very dynamic. So, I always like to pass by here to show it. For those who don't know, these alleys are called Yokocho in Japanese, and there are many of them scattered throughout Japan, mainly in Tokyo. These alleys, for the most part, were built in the post-war period, in the late 40s and early 50s. Not all of them, of course, but many were used as routes for the black market. During the war, it was common for there to be shortages of products and goods in Japan. So, the Japanese would often steal supplies from the American troops or organize robberies at the port of Tokyo when ships arrived bringing supplies for the American soldiers. They would sell these stolen and smuggled goods hidden in these alleys. Over time, Japan recovered from the damages of war, and these alleys ended up remaining throughout the city. Over time, as there was no longer a need to maintain the black market, the Japanese began to transform these small shops into izakayas, right? These are the traditional Japanese bars that exist here today. Now, it has become a tourist attraction because the aesthetic is very interesting, precisely because it was organically built in the heat of the post-war period. Tourists love it, always full of foreigners here, everyone taking lots of photos. They especially enjoy it when it's raining. What we are passing through now is Omoi Yukocho, which means Alley of Memories. I believe this is the most famous one here in Tokyo, but those who follow me here already know that. There are many of these alleys scattered throughout the city, some of them quite far from the center. So, actually, it's kind of my hobby to search for these hidden alleys around the city to take photos because I really enjoy street photography. And I post them on Instagram, you know? It's almost like a hobby, going out hunting for these hidden alleys around the city, isn't it? But anyway. You know Tokyo, right? Despite being considered the largest city in the world, it's not technically a city. Because, in reality, here in Tokyo, there are more geographical divisions than in Brazil. For example, we have the Tokyo Prefecture, which is equivalent to a Brazilian state. And the capital of the Tokyo Prefecture is a conglomerate of administrative regions that is also called Tokyo and is popularly understood as a city. But then, the neighborhoods of Tokyo, which are officially called special administrative regions, are actually like small cities, each with its own independent regional government. So, we commonly say that Shinjuku is a neighborhood in Tokyo, but technically speaking, Shinjuku is a city, isn't it? And within Shinjuku, yes, we have neighborhoods, and Kabukicho is one of those neighborhoods where we are heading now. I think it's important to mention this, just to make it clear that this region of Shinjuku is not only limited to Kabukicho. Shinjuku is immense, isn't it? We often mention that Tokyo is a city with multiple centers, right? But if we had to highlight a specific center as the main one, it would undoubtedly be Shinjuku. 
Shinjuku Station is the busiest in the world, with about 3.5 million people passing through it every day. Shinjuku is the region with the highest concentration of foreigners in all of Japan, making it an extremely cosmopolitan and multicultural city. The population density in Shinjuku is nearly 20,000 people per square kilometer. Therefore, Shinjuku is one of the main tourist, commercial, and business areas. It is undoubtedly the most important region in Tokyo and, consequently, in Japan as a whole. Within Shinjuku, we find Kabukicho, which is not only the largest red light district in Japan but also in the world. Kabukicho is a bohemian region with establishments focused on adult entertainment, such as bars, nightclubs, and brothels. These red light districts are generally associated with prostitution. However, since prostitution is illegal in Japan, the establishments involved in this industry are often controlled by the Yakuza, the Japanese mafia. This makes Kabukicho the region in Tokyo with the highest Yakuza activity and the largest presence of the mafia. Consequently, Kabukicho is considered the most dangerous region in Tokyo. It is important to emphasize that the concept of danger in Japan is completely different from the concept in Brazil, as we always mention around here. Even though it is the most dangerous neighborhood in Tokyo, the Godzilla statue, located on top of the Hotel Gracery, is a tourist attraction. Therefore, the reputation of this neighborhood as the most dangerous region is based on crime rates, which are actually low compared to other countries. Additionally, most of the crimes that occur here involve territorial disputes among gang members or incidents involving intoxicated individuals causing disturbances on the streets during the early hours. There are also cases of extortion that take place within the nightclubs. However, it is highly unlikely for an ordinary person without association with criminal organizations to be targeted for street robberies. It is a type of danger associated with the underworld of crime, not something that directly affects the average citizen. It is unlikely for an ordinary person to face problems walking around here, right? The only caution that regular citizens, especially tourists in this region, should have is regarding a scam known as Bodhikuri, as mentioned by the followers who are familiar with it. It is quite common, not only in Kabukicho but in all neighborhoods with nightclubs, to encounter people on the street who speak English fluently, are very friendly and helpful. They approach tourists, inviting them to enter the clubs, promising affordable prices, and so on. The person agrees, goes in, enjoys the night intensely, and when it's time to leave, they are surprised with an exorbitant bill, filled with undisclosed extra fees and outrageously high amounts, sometimes reaching $2,000 or even more. If the person tries to dispute it, the staff members act like they don't understand, pretend not to speak English, and in the end, if the person refuses to pay, they threaten and may even resort to violence. They specifically target tourists with this scam because, without knowledge of the Japanese language, it becomes more difficult to seek help from the police or something similar. Additionally, the police often refuse to intervene in these cases, treating them as mere misunderstandings, as if the customer had not understood the fees, you know? It is considered a misunderstanding between the customer and the establishment, not a crime. Therefore, the danger for ordinary people in this neighborhood basically involves the possibility of falling for this scam. Now, if you are a woman, there are also many instances of harassment attempts in these neighborhoods. Men stay on the streets, usually young Japanese men, and they specifically target girls, especially Japanese girls. They approach them, sometimes with unwanted flirting or approaches, which they call nampa here, which is the act of harassing and bothering women on the street. Therefore, it is very common to encounter these situations in the mentioned neighborhoods. When we see girls walking away, they quicken their pace to distance themselves from these men who bother them. However, sometimes it happens that these men are not just flirting with women but trying to recruit them to work in nightclubs, host clubs, snack bars, girls bars, which are also common in these areas. These establishments are called shakwain shokutan here, which are places of social interaction. They are not brothels, they are bars or restaurants where the main attraction is not the food but sociability. Basically, you pay for company while drinking and talking. In some cases, they may hold your hand, but nothing more, you know? 
Host clubs have both women and men, it's quite common. And it's not prohibited like prostitution because there's nothing wrong with it, right? But many tourists end up confusing these social establishments with cases of prostitution because the girls who work in these places often dress more provocatively and stand on the streets holding signs with the hourly rates for their services. However, the vast majority of the girls we see out there holding these signs are not prostitutes. They primarily work in these bars, and the value on the sign refers to the time you can spend drinking inside there, you know? You pay per hour and stay inside during that period along with them, understand? Now, there are some women, usually non-Japanese, mainly Chinese, Taiwanese, and many from Southeast Asia, such as Vietnamese and Filipinas, who are indeed prostitutes, you know? Many of them are victims of human trafficking and are trafficked here to engage in prostitution. They are much more discreet than the girls from the bars, stay further away from the center, and usually approach men offering massages. I'm not saying that legitimate massage parlors don't exist in Japan, but in these neighborhoods, in the districts known as the red light districts, when a woman approaches offering a massage, people already know it's prostitution. This is because, as mentioned earlier, prostitution is a crime, and they cannot openly declare what they are offering, you know? So they offer massages. We have talked about this several times on this channel, but just to remind you, prostitution is illegal in Japan. Brothels often disguise themselves as other types of establishments to avoid being caught by the law. In Osaka, for example, we have the Tabita Shinti district, which I have mentioned here on the channel a few times, where brothels disguise themselves as restaurants. During the service, the client and the waitress fall in love and end up having sexual relations right there in the restaurant. However, the client pays for the meal and not for the sexual act. Since the law cannot definitively prove that the client is genuinely in love with the waitress, these establishments cannot be considered brothels. Here, this type of establishment is not as common. What we have more of are soap lands, which are bathhouses where the client pays to be bathed and receive a massage. However, it operates like a typical brothel. Since it is not possible to monitor what happens inside each bathroom and there is no way to prove that it is a brothel, prostitution in Japan continues to occur freely. It is a market that generates millions every year, but these establishments operate through loopholes in the law. It is not a legalized practice. Now, here in Kabukicho and also in Rapanji, another bohemian district of Tokyo, it is very common to see many Africans working on the streets, inviting tourists to enter nightclubs with the intention of carrying out the scam we mentioned, the Batakuri. Most of them are Nigerians and Ghanaians. The older ones came to Japan in the 1980s and 1990s to work in factories, just like Brazilian descendants still do today. However, when the economic bubble burst in the early 1990s, many of them lost their jobs. At that time, most of the adult establishments in Kabukicho were still run by Chinese and Koreans. The presence of the triads, the Chinese mafia, is still reasonable in the neighborhood but much smaller than before. I mentioned in a video the case of the Blue Dragon Sword, an internal conflict between the triads from Beijing and Shanghai that took place in a restaurant here in this alley where we are now the Chinese restaurant. It happened in the 1990s and resulted in deaths and other serious incidents. However, when the Japanese economy began to stagnate and many of these Chinese and Korean establishments started to go bankrupt in Kabukicho, a vacuum emerged in the adult entertainment market. Africans, especially unemployed Nigerians who had saved money working in factories, saw the opportunity to take over these places. They started opening various nightclubs in Kabukicho, and to this day, many Africans own these nightclubs. Additionally, many younger Africans come to Japan with student visas and are hired by their compatriots to work in the nightclubs. However, it is important to mention that since the prostitution market is generally dominated by the Yakuza, many of these Africans get involved with the mafia to enter the prostitution business. Currently, the Yakuza no longer operates on the streets as before. At that time, they had about 200,000 members, but now they have about 20,000. The remaining members of the Yakuza are mainly involved in white-collar crimes with large companies and even the government. 
they still need people working on the streets for recruitment and other activities. Therefore, often these Africans work on the front lines, they are visible on the streets, they are not Yakuza members, but sometimes they have some connection to the mafia at the top of the hierarchy. Additionally, currently, even without affiliation with the mafia, some independent African gangs have emerged. There are several Southeast Asian gangs that, as I mentioned before, I recently read an article mentioning a Greek gang trying to compete in the Kabukicho market. Furthermore, there are other non-Yakuza Japanese gangs, so the market here is highly competitive, and the territory is fiercely contested, resulting in many street fights in this region, like the one we witnessed just now. As you could notice, the Japanese man confronted the African man, asking where he was, or he was. Either the individuals disappeared with someone he was with, or he was looking for someone specific, possibly a particular African, we can't be sure. Now, you must have noticed that the Japanese man had several tattoos on his leg. In Japan, we have the habit of directly associating tattoos with the Yakuza, hence the stigma regarding tattoos in Japanese society. Many gyms, beaches, and hot spring establishments have signs asking to cover tattoos before entering, precisely because of the strong association with the mafia. Now, anyone who has some knowledge about the Yakuza knows that their tattoos are distinctive, usually in the bodysuit style, covering the entire body like clothing and featuring designs with oriental motifs. Therefore, despite this Japanese man involved in the fight having many tattoos on his legs, it is clear that they were not the traditional Yakuza tattoos. After all, a Yakuza member would never subject themselves to a situation like the one he faced. But, as I mentioned at the beginning, it is more likely to imagine that the Africans work for the Yakuza at some level than to assume that this Japanese man has any connection to the mafia in this case. For a long time, as all crime in Japan was always associated with the Yakuza, even today when we think of crime in Japan, we immediately think of the Yakuza. The Japanese government also made this same association in the past since most criminal activities in Japan had some connection to the Yakuza. From the 1990s onwards, the Japanese government made significant efforts to destabilize the mafia, also due to international pressure. The challenge lies in the fact that, in some cases, the effort to eradicate the mafia was greater than the effort to combat the crime itself. This resulted in the creation of laws specifically targeting the Yakuza, and not necessarily the crimes they committed, you know? As the presence of the Yakuza decreased on the streets, other gangs emerged in the void left by anti-Yakuza laws. Since the activity itself was not criminalized, if you don't belong to the Yakuza, you can continue to carry out the same actions as if the new laws didn't exist, you know? Thus, the Hangir gangs were formed which loosely translates to gray area. These gangs operate in a legally ambiguous area. They commit serious crimes, but, not being part of the Yakuza, often manage to escape with lenient punishments. It is similar to the situation with prostitution. Crime in Japan mainly occurs through these loopholes in the law. Tattoos are a distinctive feature of hangir gangs, different from Yakuza tattoos. They follow a more Western style, and some resemble tattoos of Mexican cartels, for example. Therefore, if we were to speculate, it would be more plausible to say that the Japanese man involved in the fight belongs to one of these Hangir gangs, rather than the Yakuza. Obviously, Hangir gangs are far from being as organized as the Yakuza or the Buses Okulaki, which are the famous biker gangs here in Japan. However, due to the loopholes in the anti-Yakuza laws, they feel more comfortable acting aggressively in public, knowing that even if they are arrested, the fact that they cannot be associated with the mafia protects them from severe punishments. Therefore, a large part of the violent crimes that occur on the streets of Tokyo nowadays are usually committed by these hangir gangs. They also engage in cybercrime, which was not as common among the Yakuza since it was not a viable possibility in their time. However, scams occur frequently nowadays, especially because the Japanese population is predominantly elderly, representing about 30% of the total population. Therefore, these hangir gangs have various schemes similar to what we are used to seeing in Brazil, such as calling elderly people and pretending to be their children or grandchildren, inventing stories of accidents and requesting financial help. As for street fights, 
they are relatively common in this region, depending on the day, time, and specific streets. It is quite easy to witness a situation like the one we just saw. Those who follow my live streams have seen this before. Generally, these conflicts do not result in major consequences, which is good, you know? It seems that people are not very skilled in fighting, which is positive. Therefore, these disputes are usually resolved quickly. Firearms have been virtually eradicated in Japan, including the police not using them. Even the individual who recently shot Shinzo Abe had to make his own homemade firearm because it is extremely difficult to access them in Japan. Only the Yakuza, in specific cases to demonstrate power, occasionally commit murders with firearms. However, these cases are quite rare and usually do not affect ordinary people, you know? Unless you are somehow involved in the world of crime, the chance of becoming a victim is minimal. Walking the streets, even in the most dangerous neighborhood of Tokyo, is safer than dying from a heart attack. Another reason why the Kabukicho region has recently attracted attention is the case of the Toyoko kids, which I have mentioned in a previous video. In summary, they are teenagers who run away from home mainly due to the pressure of the educational system and Japanese society in general and end up living on the streets of Kabukicho. This movement was fueled by social media a few years ago when they started posting daily about life on the streets, showing messes and alcohol consumption. This ended up creating a misleading and romanticized image of street life, as if it were easy and fun. This led other teenagers to join them here. The police recently dispersed the camp they set up in the area around the Godzilla building, known as the Toyoko's Lair. Now they are more dispersed and spend their nights in capsule hotels or internet cafes, which are cheap and abundant in this region. The Japanese media treats them as a gang, but they don't consider themselves that way because they are not organized, you know? However, due to their street situation and inevitable contact with gangs, alcohol, and drugs, they become aggressive and commit crimes. There was at least one case of a homeless person being murdered attributed to the Toyoko kids here in Kabukicho. So, these are the pieces of information about street fights and the current criminal scenario in this region. Among all the places where these young people could have gathered here in Tokyo, it turned out that Kabukicho is the worst, you know? This is because there are so many gangs competing for territory around here and these vulnerable kids end up being exposed to exploitation because they need money, of course. So, they end up accepting work for the gangs, and the guys arrange fake documents for them, and they end up working at night, involved in wrongdoing. Cases of harassment involving underage girls have emerged, right? There was a recent famous case involving the leader of an NGO that supposedly provided psychological support for the Toyoko kids here on the street. This guy was accused of harassing a teenage girl who was consulting with him. He was arrested and later died in prison. Not many details about his death were released, but probably someone, someone killed him there, right? All of this really messes with the mental health of these young people. Just by them running away from home, you can imagine that they already had psychological problems. Here on the street, in contact with crime, in contact with alcohol, and often experiencing hardships, the situation worsens. It reached the point where a couple of teenagers who were part of the Toyoko kids, around 14 and 15 years old, jumped together from the top of a building here in the center of Kabukicho because they couldn't bear the life on the street anymore and didn't have the courage to go back home. Anyway, all of this is very complicated, you know? Kabukicho is undoubtedly one of the most historic regions here in Tokyo. It's a very vibrant neighborhood, you know? There's always a lot going on. As I mentioned, it's the area of Tokyo with the highest concentration of gangs, the biggest presence of the mafia. There are YouTube videos of Japanese people showing the exact locations of the mafia's offices here in this neighborhood. Because it's not a secret, you know? They are real establishments, some even registered on Google. Furthermore, a few blocks from here is Koreatown in Shinokubo, which, as I mentioned before, is the Tokyo region with the highest number of foreigners. So, besides having a significant Korean community in Koreatown, of course, there is also a considerable community of Indians, 
people from the Middle East, and many from Southeast Asia, such as Vietnamese, Filipinos, Indonesians, and Nepalese, for example. There are also people from Sri Lanka, although I don't know how to refer to them. But anyway, it is also one of the main tourist attractions in Tokyo, so there are always many American and European tourists staying in hotels around here. Many students who come to study or do exchange programs also end up staying in this area. It's a very interesting region, despite all its problems. Aesthetically, it is also very intriguing. I really enjoy coming here to take photos, especially when it's raining because of the reflections. Those who follow my channel already know that it's one of my favorite areas here in Tokyo. People always talk about how it also resembles video games, especially those who play the Yakuza series. The game settings are inspired by this neighborhood because it's the area where the mafia really operates, right? So, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. I summarized all the stories. I have already talked about them on my channel, so those who follow it are already aware of all these stories, but now I summarized them, right? A compilation of the most recent stories here in Kabukicho. I hope you liked it. That's it. See you later.